Now we have a very special session for you. Uh, Hannah Rosenberg, who is a developer advocate at Lightning Labs, and she will be discussing taproot assets, something super interesting personally for myself. I know you guys will all really enjoy it, and I'm going to let Hannah take it away. All right. Hello, everyone. So we were going to be talking about Lightning Node Connect, but we did a last minute switch, and today we're going to be talking about Taproot Assets. So I hope that's what everyone showed up for or is happy to hear about. All right, so we're going to do a bit of a workshop, but we don't have a ton of time, so it's not really properly a workshop. We're not going to be going through any code. But I would really love for this to be a very interactive session for us to just have a conversation about this protocol uh, as we go through it. All right. So a little bit about me. Um, I work as a developer advocate at Lightning Labs. I've been in the Bitcoin space for over a decade now. There's some of my resume, and of course, I'm on the Twitters, and Nostr as well, too. All right, so this is what we're going to talk about today. Um, the goal is very simple. I'm hoping that everyone leaves here knowing a lot more about Taproot Assets and how it actually works than you did um, when you walked in. All right, we have only 25 minutes, so we're going to do as much as we can in that time. Um, so this is a bit of an overview. We're not doing any deep dives here. All right, please ask many, many questions as we go through this. It's much more fun if we have a conversation rather than just me talking to you all. All right. And again, if we have time, we're going to do an actual live demo, just depending on how this goes. Let me look at the time. OK, it's about 12.20. All right. About you, I've made some assumptions about you all. I'm assuming that everyone sitting here is a tech-savvy Bitcoiner, which basically means that, like, I'm assuming you know what a Bitcoin UTXO is, and I'm assuming that you're familiar with the basics of Taproot, right? That's kind of the level of knowledge I'm assuming on your part. All right, and let's start with some actual questions. Is there anything that anyone is hoping to learn about today that we should touch on about Taproot assets? Yeah. Yeah, we had updates yesterday, and we talk a little bit about that here. We're not really focusing on those specific things. Yeah, so it's kind of just an overview of the protocol in general, and what came out yesterday was some refinements and functionality there. Anyone else hoping to learn something specific today? No? We're all just curious? OK, um, if you'd like to see the full slide deck, you can scan this QR code and follow along with it. Um, I do have uh, a lot of links to further resources there. I also have some very, very technical slides, which we won't really dive into in depth. But I threw them in there. So if you're really curious, you can um, have a look uh, on your own time in that slide deck. Here's what we're going to cover. We're going to talk about the protocol. Um, what are taproot assets? Um, how assets are committed to uh, in Bitcoin taproot transactions? Um, talk about asset transfers, both splits and internal transfers. And then we're going to talk a little bit, depending, we'll make a decision of what, whether or not we want to dive into universes or go uh, straight into the demo. All right, and then we talk briefly about Taproot assets on Lightning and how that works. All right, so yeah, if we have time, we'll mint an asset uh, on the testnet here. Cool. So let's get straight into the protocol. Um, there is this cool thing um, in Taproot called Tap Tweak. Uh, apologies, this is probably the most boring slide of the presentation. There's just some math. Um, but the idea is, is that in a taproot transaction, you can take your internal key, right? And then you can take some data, and then you do some hashing, and you tweak that key, and then you have this 
public tweak key that you use for your transactions. And this is how you can embed data in a Taproot transaction. So I won't go into depth on that here, but it's something that you, know, you should know, because otherwise I know it would bother me if I didn't understand what was actually going on, how this data actually got in there. So we use TapTweak. That's how all these gigantic Merkle trees that we're about to discuss, that's how it actually gets committed to or embedded, depending on how you want to think about it, uh, on the Bitcoin blockchain. All right. So here we go. So we're going to look at this picture briefly, and then we'll come back to it. But the idea is, is that we have all these Merkle trees, which we'll walk through how that's structured. But we have all these Merkle trees, and we use tap tweak. And so when there's a Bitcoin UTXO and the output right, of that UTXO, we have data that is committed to all these Merkle trees are committed to via tap tweak. So this is kind of a visualization. It's a very, very simplified Merkle tree there, and this sort of helps you maybe picture how this data gets embedded in the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, some cool features here. These transactions that embed and transfer all of these assets are indistinguishable from regular taproot transactions. That has some cool features. There's some privacy benefits. Also, there's no blockchain bloat, which means lower fees. So it's a very, very, um, I think it's an elegant, well-architected way to do this, which has these really awesome benefits. All right, and of course, this is opt-in, right? If there's a Bitcoin node, a Lightning node that doesn't like this, doesn't care about it, there's absolutely no reason for them to run this software or care about, care about it. This just runs um, on, kind of on top of sort of, you know, Bitcoin and Lightning. Now is when we talk about Merkle trees for like the next 15 minutes, lots and lots of Merkle trees. All right. We're going to talk about a sparse Merkle tree, and then a Merkle sum tree, and then we're going to put that together into a Merkle sum sparse Merkle tree. If this were later in the day, we could play a drinking game where we all have a sip every time I say Merkle, and we'd be very drunk at the end of this. <laughs> all right. Here is a little animation. We're just going to look at this, and then we'll talk through it. So here we have a simplified Merkle tree. And then we have a path which we can take, which leads us down to a particular leaf on that tree. So the idea of a sparse Merkle tree is that you can take a particular leaf. Um, again, this is very simplified, but this would be a gigantic tree, and there'd be a particular leaf sort of at the bottom of this tree. And that holds all sorts of data about a particular asset. And you hash that, and then you have this hash, which is sort of the identifier of it. And then you use a bitmap of that hash, which you can, which is also the location of that leaf in this giant Merkle tree. So if you take that bitmap and you follow it, essentially if it starts with the one, you go, what are we looking at, to the right. If it has a zero, you go to the left. So this ID maps all the way down that tree to a very specific leaf, right? And this has some interesting properties because it allows us to make sure that um, every asset has a specific location so we can prove that something is in that specific location or is not in that specific location. And so for context here, all this crazy Merkle tree structure that we're discussing, it's designed to enable proofs. Right, proofs that something is there, proofs that something's not there, proof of the amount of what's in that tree, um, proof that the amount was increased or decreased or whatever the case may be. Right? Or this data structure is designed for us to be able to prove to other people that we're not lying to them. Right? Here are the assets, these specific set of assets, and I can prove it to you. So that's what this looks like. This is a sparse Merkle tree. The ID or hash of that data maps directly to a specific leaf on that tree. 
course, very simplified. These trees are massive. Now we're going to talk about a Merkel sum tree. So we combine these two things. But here, you'll note, and we'll come back to this, look at the, the sum at the top of that tree. And we'll see how when, when one leaf on that tree changes, um, the sum all the way at the top changes as well. So that five changes to a three, and that change is reflected all the way up the tree. So here, when a Merkel sum tree, each sort of leaf or node on that tree has a numerical value, in this case associated with the amount of assets. And if one leaf on that tree changes, well, that amount gets summed all the way up to the top. So the idea is, is we reduced one leaf on this tree by two, and that change got reflected all the way up to the root of that tree where we went from eight down to six. So this, um, we put these two properties together um, to get our sparse Merkel Merkel sum tree, which is the type of Merkel tree we use to then embed these assets on the Bitcoin blockchain. So that's a lot. Does anyone have any particular questions on this interesting variety of Merkle tree? Okay, so the idea is you just want to record some information about some assets, right? Here's just some data. But you have this giant structure and you want to make it so people can't cheat, right? That's the whole idea. I can prove to you what's in this giant, giant data structure or I cannot. So with the sparse Merkel tree, we're giving everything a unique ID. So if you have this ID, you know exactly where that is in this tree. So you can go and look, you can get a proof from someone and you can say, hey, it's either there or it's not, because these are big trees, but if you can go look if it's there or not, you know exactly where it's supposed to be. And then with the addition of the Merkle sum tree, as you know, you do this fancy math, the idea is if you change the value anywhere along that bottom row of leaves on the tree, the top value is going to change as well. So with those two properties, we can prove that something is or is not in this data set, and we can prove whether or not the amount of it has changed in this data set. So it's just cool maths that we use to prove whether or not some, something is in this data set. For the purposes of this workshop, we're not going to do compare and contrast to other protocols because it's, it's, you know, we don't, don't have that much time. So this is a actually technically correct sparse Merkle, Merkle sum tree. And even this is simplified because these things are like so big that like it's hard for the human brain to conceptualize, right? But don't worry about how big it is because in these cases the vast majority of the leaves will be empty, um, so it's not a massive set of data that's going to be hard to store on your computer or anything like that. But this is the structure of it, and it's kind of cool. You can see there's kind of three different levels of trees. That first one, the blue one, that's like your Bitcoin tap root tree. Right. And then from there, this orange one is cool stuff. If you want to dive into the technicalities, that's where you have um, asset groups, right? So you can mint an asset and then later mint more of it. And that's, that tree sort of helps keep track of those asset groups. And then down here in the green, that is where we have a specific asset. So to be technically correct about it, you know, sort of from here on out, when I'm talking about, you know, a specific asset, I'm talking about that very bottom row of leaves on that green tree. But because I'm not a cruel person, I'm not going to keep showing you this picture. We're going to show you much, much simpler images of Merkle trees. But this is technically correct. All right. So now let's move on to asset transfers. So let's say I've minted a bunch of assets. Let's just go with a simple example. I've minted Hannah coin and that shows up 
as my computer you know, went and created this giant structure of trees and put some Hannah coin right in one of those leaves at the bottom of that green tree. All right, but now one of you awesome people thinks that Hannah coin is great and I'm going to send you some of it, right? So you get this software up and running and we're going to do a transfer. All right, first we'll talk about splits, which is this example. I've minted some Hanna coin. I'm going to send it to one of you all. We're both running the Taproot Assets uh, program daemon on our computer, and we can do this transfer. And then we'll talk about ter internal transfers too, time providing. OK, splits. So this one, I think, is fairly simple, right? You have this first tree here is where I have minted 10 HANA coins. You can see they live at that bottom leaf, but because we're using this sum tree structure, you can see that value gets carried all the way up to that root of the Merkle tree, and that says 10. Then I'm going to send one of you all five of my HANA coins, and what happens is, you know, my computer goes and creates a new sparse Merkle Merkle Psalm tree where I've changed the value of that leaf at the bottom, which changed it all the way up at the top. Our computers talk to each other. Your computer goes and creates a Merkle tree as well where you have five hand of coin in that bottom leaf of the green tree, right? And then once we communicate with each other and come up with this structure, then I do a transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain where I take this original tree, which is embedded via tap tweak in that tap root transaction. I create two outputs from that, you know, this original transaction is the input. Then I create two outputs. Um, one going back to me with this Merkle tree that has those five HANA coins and one in a UTXO, which goes out to you, which has another Merkle tree that has five HANA coins in it. So I just kind of like splitting into two different trees, but we can prove that I reduced my amount by five and you now have five of those coins. So pause here for questions on this one. So in theory, I'm not quite sure if that's built in to the current version, but, oh, yeah. So let me um, make sure I understand the question correctly. It's like, could you do a transaction where you have 10 outputs splitting into 10 different, sending to 10 different people? And I, like in theory, that's entirely correct. You could totally do that. I'm not sure that's, what's in the software right now. But yes, you could definitely do that. OK, this is slightly more uh, technically correct for asset splits, but we won't go through that. Now let's talk briefly about internal transfers. And this is interesting. And then we'll do a bit of example for this. Let's say I have, I made this awesome video game, and in my video game, I give people rewards, and I give them these game diamonds, right? And both Alice and Bob love my game, and they're great at it, and so they have earned lots of in-game rewards, which are these game diamonds, which are actually taproot assets, right? So in this case, let's look back up a little bit and look at keys, right? The different keys that are held in this situation. In this example, I'm holding this top level key, which is the key used for the actual Bitcoin taproot transaction. But both Alice and Bob have these asset keys, which are referenced in the you know, asset leaves all the way at the bottom of this tree. So I'm, as they're earning, you know, these rewards, I'm updating this tree. We'll talk about that in a second. And they are, you know, I'm sending them, I'm adding um, these assets to leaves on a tree that reference their key so they own them. Now, 
um, Alice sells some of her game diamonds to Bob, or I don't know, maybe she uh, lost them in some sort of challenge or something. But for whatever reason, Alice is sending some of her game diamonds to Bob. So in this situation, um, in order for this to be a valid Taproot Assets transaction, Alice has to sign off on that transfer um, from herself to Bob, right? So her, her key is necessary there. But what's going to happen then is that I, as the you know, game owner, runner, um, I am going to, after I see this transaction, I am going to record this in the Bitcoin blockchain by updating this Merkle tree. And I, well, they'll send me their information and I'll include it in my larger Merkle tree and then record it on the Bitcoin blockchain. So we can see Alice and Bob, they both had five game diamonds, but then Alice sends Bob four. So she now has one and he now has nine. So we update this Merkle tree and then I would record this in a Bitcoin transaction. So this is an internal transfer. Do they need your permission for that? Isn't that censorship problem? So this is sort of a, like a hybrid kind of situation. I cannot forge Alice's signature on that transaction. So I cannot transfer those funds on her behalf or Bob's behalf or whomever. But, but they can't do the transfer on their own. Right. So they are dependent on okay. me recording that on the Bitcoin blockchain. Thank you. So there's sort of different ways to manage these assets. And this is kind of a hybrid situation. All right. It looks like we're almost out of time. Do we? Uh, yeah. So that's about as much as we got to. It would be nice if we had like another hour. We could get through all of this. But any more questions from here? What we didn't talk about are universes, which is kind of like the blockchain explorer of the Taproot asset world, where you can get information on what's going on on a particular asset um, that you care about, or whatever the case may be. This is opt-in. You do not have to share your data with the world if you're holding these assets. Other things we didn't get to is different types of universes, and then very quickly, I want to talk about how this can work on Lightning. Fungible assets can be transferred on the Lightning network. This is coming soon, right? Not quite built. But here's the idea where you have these edge nodes. So this is the example case of like a US dollar stable coin, which is minted on this protocol. And then these edge on either side of the network, that little green line, these are edge nodes that are, you know, uh, taproot asset enabled. So we'll look at a quick video of that and then I'll wrap it up. So hopefully this gives you a good idea of how that might work. It uses the Bitcoin Lightning Network. All those nodes in the middle um, do not need to be Taproot Asset enabled, right? Just the edge nodes. Thank you, Hannah. And thank you, everybody, for being here this morning. Um, that was certainly a very interesting 